आर्काइव्स ऑफ प्रसार भारती प्रेजेंट्स द टाइमलेस ट्रेजर ऑफ गोल्डन एरा and welcome to living on the edge each week we receive countless letters complaining of land degradation pollution and illness caused by mining manas pati of rorkela orissa writes that the pollution in his town is so heavy that the sky seems like it is burning red all day long using manas's letter as a starting point nandri rajbari decided to investigate the hazards of mining and visited talcher as a case study Till the early 80s Jambu Bahali was like any other village in Talcher with functional hand pumps abundant water resources and sufficient agricultural lands to sustain its inhabitants today's Jambu Bahali is like this wherever you travel in Talcher these are the images you are likely to see The coal fields of Talcher in the Angul district of Orissa have been working non-stop since 1926. Every year 30 million tons are dug out of the earth here and the result is this. Today this region has the dubious distinction of being one of the 14 most polluted zones in the country. The Geological Survey of India estimated underground coal deposits to be about 3000 crore tons in 1855. This prompted large scale mining in the area first by the British government and after independence by the public sector company Coal India. Over time scores of heavy coal eating industries sprang up in the area. the talcher thermal power station fertilizer corporation of india and nalco to name a few as a result the talcher municipality and over 50 villages find themselves sandwiched between the mines and factories in the area coal mining involves digging the earth to reach the coal deposits the main fallout of this on the environment is the lowering of the water table we are in one of the underground mines of manadi coal fields limited These mines have to be sucked out of all underground water before they can be mined in. There are three such mines in the area, leaving all surrounding villages completely dry of all their underground water resources. Water scarcity is the bane of the villagers living around Talcher. Every month, the length of the rope used to draw water from the wells becomes progressively longer, and the hand pumps run dry. Pani da do amki tiga bahar padoji. आउ बंध पाटा खाली कोई लाइ जाऊ आम खाया असुविधा है नंदीरा पा आईवा दिन कौटर टे पाटा सुरंग पाटा रही बहुत मुश्किल का काज चलता है और दूर से पानी ले करके आता और सब औरत बहुत तकलीफ करके लाता प्रीवियसली दॉपुलेशन वॉज लेस पीपुल आर डिगिंग देयर वेल्स एंड गेटिंग द वाटर नाउ दैट वाटर इज रिक्वायर्ड बाई मोर नंबर ऑफ पर्सन एंड दैट इज क्रिएटिंग एन इम्प्रेशन दैट लॉट ऑफ वाटर हैज बीन taken away due to mining operation which is not a fact in 1984 the annual release of water by coal mines in the talcher area was estimated at 1000 crore liters you may argue that the declining water level is an occupational hazard of coal mining but the large quantities of water pumped out of mines before mining begins can be made available to the villages with a little planning and foresight instead villagers find that water is simply pumped out through underground pipes in their villages and often goes to waste 
This criticism was parried by Coal India. They insisted they were aware of their social responsibilities. Looking to the social requirement and socio-economic scenario, MCL has dug a lot of tube wells in the nearby villages. As a um, community development work, you have taken the looking to the uh, requirement of nearby villages because we believe that we cannot live in isolation. Due to mining operations, the ground water is uh, depleting. So the same water they are providing to uh, the villagers because their wells have dried up. They are providing it to the adjacent villagers and they term it as social responsibility. It is not social responsibility. Mane, what to tell of social responsibility? They are not doing any favor to those villagers. Water is just part of the problem. Blasting has caused most of the houses in the vicinity to crack. Dutika Behuria of Jambu Bahali village showed us a house which had collapsed a day before we arrived after a powerful blast in a nearby mine. Coal mining and air pollution go hand in hand at least in India. Around the coal mines, the air is thick with coal dust and constant blasting and mining ensures that smoke and dust levels are woefully constant. From the six uh, open cast mines, either the drainage water or the ambient air, four of them are not meeting our standards. We have powers to close, but you can understand the problems if you close a, a coal mine which provides all the coal for our power plants. There are, you, know, you think twice before you do that, although you, you have the powers. Makes you wonder whether everyone is better off without a pollution control board. The level of accountability is dismal. Untreated waste and effluent pour into the Brahmani, the second largest and most polluted river of Urissa. Would it surprise you to know that marine life in the river has disappeared and fishermen 25 kilometers downstream have lost their livelihood? <laughs> The polluting units of the area are all government undertakings. Living on the edge was unable to get the industry's point of view. We were told that government officials are not authorized to speak on camera without clearance from headquarters. Have you had the effluent uh, tested ever, which the industries are discharging? Oh, yes, we do. Yes, well, do, what it was it the regularly. we do it regularly. What were the results? Well, not very happy. <laughs> These are mega industries and belonging to the core sector. So that's why you always you know, a little conservative, little careful before you take a serious action. Living on the edge was astounded to see this spot on the banks of one of the tributaries of the Brahmani River. We didn't know whether to be happy or horrified at the candidness of the FCI. The words say it all. Over 30,000 people have already been evacuated from villages around the mines and further industrial expansion in the area is on the cards. Just what its environmental costs will be and who will meet it is a moot question. For the locals of Talcher, it is only a matter of time before their lands will be torn open by steel and dynamite. Pollution control authorities have already turned a blind eye and deaf ear to the mounting environmental costs that could have been reduced by effluent treatment and the greening of abandoned mines. Desolate and barren, the Talcher landscape will soon become a mute testimony to our inability to work environmental safeguards into commercial activity. That the offenders are public sector companies will only be a bitter irony. Not only do trees provide us with a green cover, act as a sound barrier, trap dust, as well as keep summer temperatures down, they also purify the air that we breathe, providing us with life-giving oxygen. Plant a tree, nurture it and take care of it as if it were your own. Remember, every action of yours counts. Still to come, a raised eye view of electronic pollution and why the business of saying it with flowers is booming. But first,
Episode 57, September 1995, Hospital Waste. Living on the Edge catalogues the dangers of hospital waste and argues for proper collection and effective disposal of what can become a potential source of disease and infection. March 1st, 1996. In response to a public interest petition filed by Dr. B. L. Vadera, the Supreme Court issues a directive to the central government, the Ministry of Health, and several other departments. Incinerators must be installed, says the Apex Court, in all hospitals and nursing homes with over 50 beds in nine months' time. There is an appeal against this ruling by the Nursing Home Forum and a citizens action group called Sakshi, who say any old incinerator won't do. In the absence of a prescribed standard as to the design of the incinerator and air pollution control devices, there is a danger that harmful pollutants will be emitted into the atmosphere. creating yet another source of pollution may 7th 1996 the supreme court rules that only incinerators or any other alternative devices approved by the central pollution control board must be installed the cpcb is asked to lay down strict standards the court warns that if remedial measures are still not forthcoming punitive action will follow verdict so far so good will the hospitals install the incinerators as prescribed who will check to see that they are functioning and what will happen if they are not we'll have to wait and see but the first step has been taken pollution 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 the world is full of pollution flora withers of infection and fauna perishes of contamination nature is cursed with destruction and man is crushed with starvation Pollution 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 the world is full of pollution that was an extract from a poem written by Suresh Babu of Mandya Karnataka who has covered virtually every type of pollution in his poem but even he would be surprised if he knew what Zareen Taj Jalil has in store for him You are surrounded by invisible fields orbiting the planet at maximum velocity The moon with a rebel base will be in range in 30 minutes. They are increasing their hold on you. You can try running away with just your mobile phone connecting you with the rest of the world, but you are running in vain. They still surround you. You may laugh at the warning thinking it's from a thriller but it's actually quite close to reality. Research has shown that the ever increasing exposure to electromagnetic fields is potentially harmful to human beings. Extensive electrification and the introduction of sophisticated electronic gadgets have placed many of us right at the center of what has come to be known as non-ionizing radiation. That sounds like gobbledygook. but it pays to know where this radiation comes from telecommunication equipment including cellular phones radio and television sets radars industrial processing units medical appliances and electrical consumer goods recent research has indicated that a very low level of the magnetic field can also interact with the biological systems in fact If from a CRT display a field of 2 to 3 milligauss can cause abortion in the pregnant woman Living near high tension lines such as these implies exposure to radiation of about 100 milligauss Although research is still going on some experts feel high tension lines can make individuals susceptible to cancer In Pittsburgh studies have revealed leukemia and lymphoma at five times the expected rate among workers who have been exposed to high currents while working in an aluminum plant. You may think you're safe if you don't live close to power lines, but you will have to change your opinion when you find out that electrical and electronic appliances that we take for granted as symbols of progress create electromagnetic fields in their vicinity. Sometimes a field generated by one appliance may interact with another field generated from another working gadget nearby to exacerbate the problem. 
a 73% increase in miscarriages among women who used video displays for over 20 hours a week during the first trimester of their pregnancy was first reported in Canada and in the United States. The assessment of the impact of low-frequency exposure is likely to continue for many years to come. In the meantime, what we can do is follow a policy of prudent avoidance. A checklist for avoiding exposure might include sitting at least two meters away from television screens, turning off your computer monitor when not in use, and staying at least one and a half meters away from the backs and sides of other terminals. In Europe and in the United States, manufacturers are already developing systems with lowered fields. A piece of equipment or appliance can be classified as a culprit and as a victim. A culprit causes radiation and a victim is one with susceptibility to surrounding radiation. For example, your mixer is operating and then you see in the television uh, there is some noise that is coming or noise bands are coming. We take it for granted, okay, it's all right, it's coming. The European Community Electromagnetic Compatibility Directive is a move towards reducing electromagnetic radiation. According to this directive, all electronic equipment placed in the market or taken into service must comply with specific electromagnetic regulations. Some sort of a certification is essential for our country. And in the present uh, so-called liberalization scenario, if, uh, uh, I mean, the other countries can dump their equipment which do not fulfill the EMI EMC regulations. Do they mention any kind of EMC test that the product has gone through? No, they have never mentioned that EMC test. Are there any EMI standards in India? Yeah, there are quite a few. So how long do you think it's going to take uh, till they become mandatory in India? Well, I can't say, but uh, we can expect at the technical committee which is working upon it, um, if I say that our expectation will be something like 2080. Computers locked. Getting a signal. If I were to tell you that an industry could manage with B-grade land, eco-friendly pest control and reap lakhs in profits, you would probably shake your head in disbelief. Well, watch Sneha Koshi's report from Bangalore and have a change of heart. They say a rose is a rose is a rose and that a rose by any other name would still be a rose. This is probably because no single name is adequate to describe its beauty and subtle essence. Flowers reach out to everybody. They are a favourite offering to the gods. We have put them in our hair and even garland our vehicles with them. Flower power dominates weddings, funerals and even our biryani and pan. India's fascination with flowers is shared by dozens of countries across the world. In fact, the global trade in flowers is valued at $40 billion a year. Floriculture is a major foreign exchange earner, as many Indian entrepreneurs are discovering. The whole world is a market. Uh, there is Russia, the Far East, Japan, and then we have also the Middle East. Then again, we have a, a tremendous possibility in our domestic market. We have the potential of growing an excellent quality flower. We have to sort out the problems with regard to getting the quality flower into the markets without losing it. Experts say that by 2000, floriculture earnings can bring in over 500 crore rupees in foreign exchange. There are signs of uh, growing uh, flower industry uh, in India because of the encouragement given by the government of India in terms of various subsidies, etc. Lots of units have come up. I would put it uh, like this. The cost of uh, all these, the uh, investment they make, can be written off in about uh, two to three years' time. Easy recovery of the initial investment makes floriculture an exciting proposition. The only catch is that international standards require a certain stem length and thickness as well as flower size and you can't afford to damage even a single leaf. After three months when the flowers appear, they are harvested and maintained in a cold room 
at minus 2 degrees centigrade. The flowers are then packed and bunched according to stem length and leaves for export. Because all this is time bound, it's not as easy as it looks. When you look at the disadvantages, you have the infrastructure which is not there. You should always have a direct flight into the market that you're going for, especially with flowers being perishable. To help improve facilities for growers, an international auction center has been set up in Karnataka. Plans include providing a cold chain, chartering flights and ensuring Indian flowers get the highest rating of triple zero, which is a perfect grade when they arrive at their destination. Now I think with uh, things being more streamlined and the availability of flowers throughout the year, it uh, kind of regulates our business and we can confidently take up orders without any kind of uh, risks of not receiving flowers or things. In general, the business has been much better. One hectare yields 70,000 flowers and a profit of one crore rupees. The land needn't be terribly fertile. The only necessity is lots of water, eco-friendly pest control measures and environment-friendly fertilizers. With the popularity of flowers increasing and spanning the globe and generations, the going looks good to turn every occasion into a reason to say it with flowers. It came to India with some Portuguese merchants in the 17th century. Since then, tobacco used in cigarettes, pan masala and kheni has taken many lives and continues to do so. The Indian Medical Gazette in 1902 reported that about one-third of the cancer admissions to the Madras General Hospital were of cheek cancer associated with tobacco chewing. Ninety years later, there are over 200,000 new cases of tobacco-induced cancer each year, whether it's cancer of the throat, of the lungs or of the mouth. Of the total number of cancer cases reported in 1992 in India, 30% of the cases were of women. About 800,000 deaths in India each year are caused by tobacco-related diseases. That is 2,191 deaths every day, or 91 people dying every hour. By the time you finish watching this episode, 45 tobacco deaths would have taken place. Children love collecting things, collecting stamps, collecting coins, and collecting dried flowers. But some of us don't lose this habit even after we've grown up. We leave you this week with a peek into one man's pet obsession. This is a tale of pebbles who got bolder. If you're the sort who collects pebbles, maybe it's time for a change of heart. The sort Dr. Rajwade underwent. It's been my passion from childhood, really. For its volume, the Earth is the heaviest planet in the solar system, with rocks constituting 98% of the Earth's crust by weight. Hidden under the Earth are... Complete stone like this, closed up. And you open it up with a diamond saw, and inside you can get some very beautiful crystals. Rocks are formed by the cooling of molten material over centuries. Some are formed by sand and clay getting layered over time, or they are created by heat and pressure. There are about 2,000 constituents in the Earth's crust, and their combinations present a bewildering and dazzling assortment of colors, shapes, and textures. Of course, it's up to you to choose what you'd like to unearth. If it's an ugly stone, I wouldn't have it. Even if it's going to complete my collection, I wouldn't have it. Where do you get these uh, stones from? Mostly in India from Pune and surrounding quarries, but I've got some uh, foreign ones also, English and uh, Spanish and Congo and so on. Delving deeper may serve you well if you enjoy beautiful rocks which look like but are not priceless gems. Some of them go into hundreds, thousands, but rarely. Most of them, for a jeweler, they are nothing. Just pieces of ordinary rock. But for a collector, they are quite an interesting specimen. 